I'd like to end with posing a few questions that, um, that we think are rather intriguing in light of all this, things that um, certainly we're not able to answer right now and we'd like to see more work on. First of all, in detail, what is the valence of copper and what is the effect of FO2 on that? I think we're seeing much more, um, we're just seeing a small amount of Cu3+, plus, whereas the, the Bell Labs group seems to be seeing a lot more Cu3+. Plus. I think that may reflect the difference between the orthorhombic and the tetragonal type. Um, we believe we're going to see large resistance anisotropies, and I'm very interested to see uh, measurements of that effect. I think that there's a question about the nature of the lattice distortions, and I've heard of one TEM group, Hugo Steinfink reported at the American Crystallographic Association meeting this week that they've even seen some monoclinic phase. And we certainly are going to have a, a defect ordering in superstructures, and I think the need for neutron data is quite clear. Thanks very much. Thank you. This set of papers is open for discussion. Can we have the lights, please? Yes. I think I think we do see SIS uh, tunneling, but uh, this is indicated in the in the three and five successive peaks. This means that the first gap is a real is really one one uh, delta and not two delta. This this will be two delta for SIS. For SIS, I should, for SIS, I should have one, one, one. For, for, S, for SIS, I should have one, one, one. But if this is, but if this is a, 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 a quasi particle, then I'll have one, three, five. Because what I'll have is essentially normal metal uh, insulator, su superconductor, insulator, superconductor, and this will give me this. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yes. Way in the back. David Rudman from uh, MIT. I have a question for Dr. Gavaller. We couldn't read your critical current plot back here due to a fuzzy monitor. I wonder if you could put it back up and read the uh, scales for us so that we could see what they were. So that we can tell what the critical current was and what the field ranges were that you measured them at. I have a secret. I couldn't read them either. I'm going to put on my glasses. <laughs> You're going to actually have to read them because it's not going to be clear enough back here. No, the other plot. Oh, that, that's the Lanslim strontium. Okay. Okay, here's 10 squared. That's 72 uh, degrees. That's uh, the red line is after annealing for uh, 12 hours at 700 degrees in oxygen. That's the only uh, bit of data we have on our first uh, effort to improve the JCs through uh, various annealings. Next one is 61 degrees. That's somewhere around between 20, 10 to the second, 10 to the third. This is again 10 to the third. This is 44 degrees, 30 degrees. 15 degrees, 7 degrees, 4.2 degrees. The top of the scale is 10 to the fourth. And what was the field? The field goes uh, up to 60. 60 per yeah. kilo arsten. And those are amps per square centimeter? Yeah. Was there a time dependence to those measurements? Not that I know of. I didn't do it. If you want uh, the fellow primarily responsible to try to answer that, Alex is in the audience. Alex, I couldn't hear that. Uh, Alex, he says you... no. Oh. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yes, you had a question? Uh, yes, Ken Gray from Argonne. For the people that are making thin films, 
Could you give us some idea of the temperature at which you condensed the films and also the annealing treatment that you did afterwards? No, I'm sorry, this, uh, these were not films. I, you can't say as much as you want to say in five minutes. I should have emphasized, though, these were pressed uh, pallets. I, I believe that's addressed to uh, yeah. uh, the Stanford. Oh, well, I, I think I cannot say anything. I'm so sorry. Okay. Yes, way in the back. There's a question way in the back. Uh, th this is Mark Williams from Harvard University, and I'm just wondering if uh, the Stanford group would uh, comment on the, uh, what barriers, barriers they may have used for the uh, tunneling measurements in the junctions. Same as for the films. I cannot say I'm sorry. Uh, yes, in the front. Yeah. Regarding the phonon that was present in the um, strontium doped compound, but not in the pure, what was the frequency of that? Okay, the, uh, that was... Uh, Can you use the microphone, Stuart? Uh, yeah. uh, that was at 85 milli-electron volts, approximately 1,000 degrees. Okay, any other questions? Okay, I'd like to thank this set of speakers. Okay, we have our uh, speakers assembled here. The uh, first, first talk is Phenomenological and Microscopic Approaches to the Theory of High TC Superconductivity. Uh, the talk is given by uh, Dr. D.H. Lee. My collaborator is uh, Ji Sung Ying at uh, Bell Core. Since uh, I have such a short time, I will just uh, uh, state my basic assumptions and summarize my results. Our first assumption is that there are two partially filled uh, bands at the Fermi level instead of one. They are respectively the copper dx squared minus y squared and dz squared orbitals. The justification for this assumption for the lanthanum bearing compound, uh, we assume that the strong correlation in the narrow DZ square band lifts that band up to the Fermi level. And for the bearing e train compound, however, uh, recent structure study depend on different models, you could have a, a smaller young Taylor splitting between the DX square minus Y square and Z square orbital. And moreover, you can have a larger dispersion of the Z square band. So in that case, at Fermi level, you can very well to have uh, two bands. Uh, my second assumption is that there is a strong um, phonon-mediated interband scattering. Uh, this phonon in the lanthanum bearing compound, we believe, is associated with the rocking of the oxygen octahedron, or can be associated with the young Taylor distortion. Uh, such a interband scattering process introduce a term like this in the Hamiltonian. We know that such a term is not a density-density interaction. It's a purely off-diagonal scattering term. Thirdly, we also think that there might be a weak intraband pairing due to the phonon, uh, or uh, it could also be due to the electronic process. Uh, such an interband, uh, intraband pairing, of course, just introduced the ordinary BCS-like pairing term in the uh, model. Uh, based on these three assumptions, we derive the following consequences. The first consequence is that we find the interband scattering enhanced TC regardless of the sign of v V12. This is a very surprising re uh, result. I'm going to explain why. Uh, in fact, the equation for TC in terms of the intra and the interband parent parameter was derived by Schur et al. first in 1959. The reason that the sign of V12 is irrelevant can be best understood in terms of the Anderson pseudo spin language. In that representation, two bands become two coupled spin chain. And the anti ferromagnetic coupling between the chain represent a positive V12. And the ferromagnetic interaction intra-chain represent a net attractive interaction. 
We know that in this topology, such an antiferromagnetic magnetic interaction doesn't do any harm because we can just globally rotate the lower chain with respect to the upper one and make the coupling ferromagnetic. Therefore, you have globally ferromagnetic coupling, therefore long range order is stabilized. In such a model, uh, at temperature below TC, there are in general two, solu uh, two gaps. Uh, and both gaps vanish at the transition temperature. In general, one gap will be greater and the other will be smaller than the BCS value. So, we find the interband scattering as a very appealing mechanism to enhance TC. A, because uh, it, regardless of the sign of V12, it enhances TC, and B, because it is not a density-density interaction, therefore a strong V12 does not introduce a charge density wave instability as in the usual interband case. Moreover, we have also uh, considered the electronic mechanism for superconductivity. Starting with the two-band Haber model, we have calculated the screening of the interaction between dx squared minus y squared electron due to the intra and the interband polarization process. The following figure is constructed where we only include the intraband polarization and this solid blue curve is the Landau damping boundary and the red regions are where the electron-electron interaction between x squared minus y squared band electrons uh, is attractive. To include the interband scattering channel, usually it introduces another narrow strip of attractive region at the expense of a narrower intraband attractive region. Uh, finally, we find it rather amusing that, uh, in fact, one of the guiding principles where Alex Miller and Benos used to find high temperature superconductivity was that uh, they are looking for Young Teller active transition metal element in metallic oxide. And Young Teller activity is exactly an indicator of close line band and strong interband scattering. Thank you for your attention. Oh, sorry. Uh, I promised my my colleague to uh, to to tell you that uh, Alex Malazimov has a phenomenological theory, and the preprints are uh, available. Thank you. Our next talk is Temperature Dependent Gap Measurements on High TC Superconductors by uh, Dr. Zach uh, Schlesinger. Okay. I'm going to talk about uh, measurements of the energy gap in these uh, high TC superconductors and measurements um, with the infrared, which go to higher frequencies, and with which we observe a, uh, an interesting electronic excitation at about 60 millivolts. Uh, I'll start with the, uh, briefly just show uh, standard transitions in resistance versus temperature with uh, the lanthium strontium compound and with the yttrium barium compound, observe nice sharp TCs in the right places. And most recently, with a uh, 400 nanometer thick thin film, uh, which also shows a very nice uh, transition uh, with an onset at 97K. And uh, looking at the uh, tunneling, first of all, very quickly, the solid lines show the uh, data from both the yttrium compound and the lanthanum compound. The uh, dashed curve shows the ordinary BCS theory for point contact tunneling into a uh, superconductor. And the dotted line shows the Gaever model for tunneling into a granular superconductor. And you can see that the data lies somewhere between the two. And uh, you can... Uh, Estimate a gap for this tunneling expressed in terms of 2 delta over KTC of between the BCS value of 3.5 and about 5 or 6. Um, tunneling into thin films produces similar results, similar estimates for the gap. Um, now, we've also looked at the gap by infrared measurements. And um, primarily, we do this by reflectivity from a nominally smooth surface, and here you show as a function of frequency 
the ratio of the superconducting to normal reflectivity, and you see below the gap, the superconductor is highly reflecting. There's this strong, at the lowest temperature, strong overshoot to uh, showing an excess of, quite a strong excess absorption in the superconductor, which uh, Salusky has referred to. Um, and by looking at this at several temperatures, one can get the gap as a function of temperature. And we show that here. And uh, if you scale the BCS down to deal with the fact that the infrared gap is much smaller than the BCS, it's about 2 kTc, it, there's no real significant deviation from BCS obvious in this data. So basically, let me just conclude this first uh, part of this five minute talk by saying that the gap you measure with infrared is much smaller than what you measure with tunneling. Uh, and that you see a very sharp absorption threshold. Now, I'd like to talk now about this electronic mode, which we see at 60 millivolts. Um, basically, when you find a new superconductor, a new class of superconductors, I think there's two things that are very important. One is you'd like to know the structure. You'd like to know what it is. And the other is you'd like to know what the mediating excitation is, what the mechanism that's causing the superconductivity is. And particularly when you're at these kind of temperatures, you have to seriously consider that it might be non-phonon. So this is one of the reasons we were particularly excited to see an electronic absorption threshold at about 60 millivolts. And uh, that's shown here. Um, there's actually two features in this data in this region. One is this Lorentz oscillator feature. This is absorptivity versus frequency. This, these dots show the, the Druda, calculated Druda value based on the measured resistivity. This shaded red region indicates the excess absorptivity you get due to this electronic absorption threshold, which is typical of the kind of signature you might see, for example, due to an inter subband uh, excitation, but occurring at 60 millivolts rather than in the region of several volts where you, never, where you usually see these in metals. These things at such a low energy, this is extremely rare. And having seen it in this high TC superconductor makes us uh, suspect that it might have something to do with the superconductivity, particularly because we find as we vary the composition away from that which gives you high TC superconductivity, this signature changes significantly. So um, that's basically where I'd like to conclude. Uh, we've seen these, we've done these gap measurements, which show uh, a gap much smaller than the BCS, and we've observed an electronic mode at 60 millivolts in resonance with a phonon, and uh, we, we suggest that perhaps this electronic mode and the resonant phonon as well are involved in mediating the superconductivity here. And perhaps the reason that you get, can get such high TCs is associated with this low line electronic mode and its mediating interaction. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next talk is high TC superconducting oxides and it's given by uh, Dr. Milton S. Darkochvili. collaborators in this work are uh, Brian Maple, Guanan Yang, uh, Marcelo Ferreira, John Neumeyer, uh, Hudzo, and Yassin uh, Dali Shaul from the University of California, San Diego. Uh, we were a little skeptical with the finding of uh, superconductivity at high temperatures in the oxides. And one way we found to convince ourselves that this was a both phenomenon uh, was to coat a copper dish with uh, a lantern 1.8 strontium 0.2 copper oxide sample and lower the temperature below uh, the superconducting uh, super transition temperature. Uh, 
at, uh, 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 and we could then uh, float a samarium uh, cobalt-5 uh, magnet under these uh, circumstances. Let me show you some of our uh, latest uh, uh, findings. Here we show the temperature dependence of the resistivity for a single phase lanthanum 1.8 uh, strontium 0.2 uh, uh, copper oxide. We found a very uh, sharp uh, resistivity transition with onset at 38 Kelvin, uh, but a foot develops uh, at the, uh, mid, uh, uh, the middle of the transition and, and, uh, and the resistivity goes to zero only at about uh, at 28 Kelvin. Now we measured uh, the specific heat of the sample, which is plotted here as C over T versus T. Uh, we did not find any noticeable uh, jump at the superconducting transition temperature. However, there is uh, a noticeable uh, change in, uh, in, in slope near TC. Uh, one unusual thing that we found here is that there is an electronic uh, uh, specific heat left, left over at low temperatures. Gamma at uh, these lowest temperatures is about uh, 5 millijoules per mole per uh, Kelvin square, and it remains to be seen if uh, this value is intrinsic or uh, is due to a, a, an impurity phase. In the view graph, we show uh, a plot of susceptibility versus temperature, uh, which uh, indicates that about 25% uh, uh, of the sample is superconducting. In this next view graph, we show a curve of resistivity versus temperature for uh, yttrium barium uh, copper oxide with an onset at about 90, uh, 93 Kelvin. Uh, and a complete transition a little below 70 Kelvin. The susceptibility data for this sample indicates uh, uh, about 8% uh, of the full Meissner effect. As you have seen already several times tonight, uh, substitution of europium or any other rare earth uh, for yttrium does not change the uh, uh, the temperature, the superconducting transition temperature, and we found that for uh, europium barium copper oxide, um, an onset of about 90 Kelvin. A curve of susceptibility versus temperature for this sample indicated, uh, uh, again, an onset at about 90 Kelvin, and uh, that about 60. Uh, 60 percent, uh, we saw about 60 percent of the full Meissner effect. In an attempt to uh, find more of these high temperature superconductors, we've been trying to make uh, samples in several uh, of the perovskite and also spinel uh, stoichiometric compositions, and uh, these are some of our, uh, of our findings. Uh, we found also that uh, uh, Ytterbium and scandium substitutions uh, some, uh, might not in increase TC substantially, but they do sharpen the transitions quite a bit, which might have to do with uh, promoting uh, more uh, pure phases. Thank you. Thank you, Milton. Um, next talk is electron tunneling measurements of the energy gap in a lanthanum strontium copper oxide superconductor. Talk is given by uh, Dr. Jay Morlin.
Okay, I'd like to talk about a uh, new vacuum tunneling technique that we've been using to look at these uh, new materials. Um, this work is done at the National Bureau of Standards in Boulder, and we've got samples from Ku and Shelton at Ames Laboratory, Brzezinski at uh, Westinghouse, and Hong and Ko at ATT Bell Labs. Uh, it's a simple technique. Essentially, uh, a superconducting filament is mounted on a bending beam. You develop a surface strain in the beam by bending it, and there's enough strain to actually fracture the filament. And then you relax the beam in order to make a tunneling contact. Generally, this is done in liquid helium so that uh, you prevent oxidation of the surfaces of the fracture elements. And just to motivate you for what you can see using this technique, is a this is a naivium 10 junction. Um, you can see it's a very nice IV curve, and it's very stable mechanically, so stable that you can actually take derivatives and see phonon structure in uh, the IV curve. Um, here's some results for. Uh, lanthanum strontium copper oxide. Um, this is a sample from Ames at uh, T equals 4 Kelvin in the bath. And uh, by far the most often curve that we saw was this one that had very little structure but seems to have a zero bias anomaly in the resistance. The current very closely follows a square law dependence on voltage. Occasionally we'd see curves that had more structure and Here's the prize winner here. Uh, very nice, uh, convincing quasi-particle uh, tunneling gap. And uh, the distance from here to here is 28 millivolts. If you assume identical superconductors on either side, then uh, that means the energy gap should be seven millivolts, one fourth of that. And the ratio of two delta over KBTC would be 4.5. Um, here's another setting where we actually took derivative data and you can see that there's very strong structure away from the gap defined by the distance between or in between uh, these two peaks looks fairly symmetric and uh, if you try and force this data into the mcmillan rao program assuming some sort of background or normal state conductance which we didn't really measure you can uh, sort of convince yourself that maybe there's a low phonon mode in here giving rise to a high TC. Um, here's some uh, yttrium barium copper oxide. Uh, again, most of our settings show very little structure and uh, the uh, square law dependence of the current on voltage. You can see that's evident in the uh, derivative trace. And here's another setting. You can see, again, there's a fairly convincing quasi-particle gap there. And uh, we measure wing-to-wing -wing being 78 millivolts, which implies that uh, with the transition temperature of 93 Kelvin in this material, the 2 delta over KBTC is 4.7. Finally, I'd like to uh, show a glimmer of uh, supercurrent. If you look, there's a little guy right there, and there's the derivative. This is, again, the uh, yttrium barium copper oxide. Thank you. Thank you. The uh, next talk is Infrared Magnetic and Elastic Properties of High TC Superconductors. Uh, this paper is given by Professor Alex Settle. Uh, this is the Berkeley Group working on high TC superconductors in the experimental program. John Clark, uh, Ron Gronsky, Raymond John Lowe's, Norman Phillips, Paul Richards, David Shirley, Angie Stacy, Peter Yu, and myself. 
theoretical effort, Marvin Cohen, Vladimir Kraysen, and Stephen Louis, three people deserve special mention for keeping a project focused, Norman Phillips, Angelica Stacy, and Marvin Cohen. One particularly important question from an application's point of view is, is the resistance really zero in these superconductors? One can drill a hole in the material, use a squid, and try to measure persistent current, determine an upper limit for the resistivity. John Clark has done that and finds that for all practical purposes, it is indeed zero. The upper limit is 10 to the minus 17 ohm centimeters. The next question is, how much of the sample is superconducting? Is it a bulk superconductor? Here for the yttrium compound is true Meissner effect data. You can see a very sharp break at TC, and this is corresponding to approximately 20% Meissner effect. This is not screening, this is Meissner. Another important way of determining fraction of bulk superconductivity is using specific heat. This is data from Norman Phillips, where one has subtracted the specific heat measured in a field of seven Tesla from zero field data. One sees a very nice anomaly at TC. This is for lanthanum calcium copper oxide. The discontinuity is about 0.7%. One can extract fraction of material which is superconducting from that. It's 0.27 in this case. Similar experiments in lanthanum strontium have 78% of the sample being the bulk superconductor. One can also extract gamma values. Another question, where is the gap? How big is it? What's its temperature dependence? Using far infrared measurements, reflectivity. One has a very nice BCS function followed by the gap, opening at TC, flattening out at low temperatures. Again, consistent with other studies, the gap seems to be smaller than BCS and smaller than uh, tunneling measurements. We've looked at elasticity. This is measuring Young's modulus in this material as a function of temperature. We have a, a soft phonon mode, indicative of a tendency to structural phase transition. At TC, there's a discontinuity in Young's modulus, which can be related to the specific heat. Some transport measurements. Here's Hall effect as a function of temperature. One has a carrier density, 7 times 10 to the 21 at room temperature. There are interesting anomalies right at TC, which might be related to granular type of superconductivity. Thermal power looks very similar to what other people have measured. Thermal power is a function of temperature. Again, it goes to zero at uh, TC and has this unusual shape for most samples we've measured. Putting pressure on, one can increase TC. We can squeeze up to uh, a few hundred kilobars. This is showing that TC has saturated. We're being conservative, calling TC the midpoint of the resistance drop. For strontium, it is saturated. For barium, it's still going up at 60 or 70 kilobars. Yttrium barium, we've done some studies. This is a typical resistance plot with uh, TC around 90 degrees. Some of our preliminary data will be published in physics letters March 23rd. We've also seen uh, high temperature resistance fluctuations at numerous temperatures, the highest being 240 degrees. Those materials have not shown full superconductivity. Pardon? Okay. We've done some structural studies on presumably single phase materials. This is x-ray. These numbers agree with what's been reported by the Bell Labs group. And looking again at the structure with uh, atomic resolution microscopy, here, let me put this on right, Ron Gronsky's work. One can see the, the white dots are the uh, copper atoms, and one sees on a very small atomic scale that these things are not very uniform. One has the inclusions, uh, boundaries, and it remains to be seen how important these are. Thank you. Okay, these papers are open for discussion. Yes. David Rager from Los Alamos National Laboratory. Do you have any guess, any guess why the tunneling measurements and the spectroscopy measurements get different values in the gap? You see the difference about a factor two. 
Well, uh, in my two, uh, two band model, uh, there are two gaps. And uh, usually, uh, you find one gap with two delta over KTC greater than 3.5, and one is uh, less than 3.5. So I'm proposing that, in fact, in IR, you are seeing one, and internally, you are seeing the other. So then the question is why internally you are seeing the la larger gap and in IR you are seeing the uh, smaller one because internally actually you are fitting to the gear theory uh, for a smaller gap the uh, experimentalist is much more reluctant in claiming a small gap against a, a larger one. And for IR uh, naturally you will see the uh, lowest uh, uh, onset of absorption. Just, just an additional comment. If you just look at the simple two-band model, you, you find that the infrared is very much more sensitive to the smaller gap if that corresponds to a heavier mass. Okay, I think there's a question way in the back. Yeah, Cy Foner from the Magnet Lab at MIT. I guess I'm also asking the question to save time for Doug Finnemore from Ames. Uh, the last speaker, Zato, mentioned that he didn't see uh, complete superconductivity at the higher temperatures. Do you see any superconductivity at these higher temperatures? We do not see anything which you would normally call superconductivity. We see drops in resistance, which uh, are interesting in light of the history of this, uh, these materials. We do not see superconductivity. We have not looked at the magnetic effects in those materials. Yes, in the front. Uh, Jim Saul from Princeton University. My question is to uh, Mr. Schlesinger. Uh, how does your 60 millivolt, millivolt uh, feature in your absorption change with the uh, amount of strontium you uh, put into the oxide superconductor? Does that tell you that? Sure, go ahead, Jack. Okay, the. Uh, Feature, as I showed you before, it looks like this. Uh, can, can you use the microphone, yeah. Zach? Thanks. For a, for a composition where, of strontium 0.15, where you have a TC of about 35K for this, this is the, uh, this, this is the signature. Now, if you look at uh, several other compositions, all of which do not show high TC, uh, basically different strontium con concentration, also somewhat different copper in one sample, you see that uh, this strong phonon feature is, is much weaker. There seem to be several phonon peaks. And the, the height of the infrared uh, of the electronic absorption as, is diminished. Actually, because the Druda background is coming up here at the same time for the others, because they're poor conductors, the, it's diminished even more than it would look at a, at a quick glance if you compare and look at the deviation from Drude. Thank you. No, this is not a film. This is a smooth bulk sample. Yes. Reflection from a bulk sample. And there's a question way in the back. Uh, it, I would like to make a comment exactly to this excitation at 60 mV. Uh, we have measured the phonon density of states on the superconductor just as well as a non-superconductor. It's not up here in the paper yet. And we do see that the out-of-plane breathing modes are exactly placed at that place. And uh, that uh, going from the non-superconductor to the superconductor, we see a pronounced softening of that peak. Uh, I might also mention that this peak uh, mentioned before uh, uh, by Mr. Wolf, uh, which disappears for the high-frequency mode, which disappears for the, uh, for the superconductor. Uh, we don't find that in our neutron results. In fact, it's, it's, it's right there. Uh, I hope to be able to present uh, the complete uh, neutron data at the end of uh, our panel session here. Could you please state your name and institution, even though you're going to speak later? Excuse me, please. Please state uh, your na me. name and institution. GOMF, Kernforschungszentrum Karlsruhe. Thank you. Okay, any other? Yes. My name is uh, Radi al from California State University. My question is to Dan Kai. Can, can you speak into the microphone, please? Yes, uh, to Dan Kai. Concerning the two-band model, uh, when uh, V12 is positive, say, uh, 
you still get superconductivity. And that's because TC, in TC it appears as V12 squared, actually. I, uh, in graphite uh, potassium compound, which is superconducting, uh, neither graphite nor potassium is superconducting, but when you mix them, you get a two-band model also there. You get S and P states. And I proposed, actually, this interband coupling there to explain the anisotropy. And, uh, and I made that remark, and Professor Patrick Lee, like, totally objected, said that this is completely unphysical. You cannot have superconducting state if the coupling is repulsive. Uh, I think I think you slightly uh, misunderstood uh, Patrick. In fact, uh, recently I had a chat uh, with him, and in fact, uh, Patrick uh, uh, went back and chat uh, check uh, Shu's original paper, and he seemed to agree with uh, the fact that a positive V one two could give rise to a uh, superconductivity. Is is Patrick here? Uh, uh, Okay, any other uh, questions? Yes. Uh, my name is Sangbu Nam and the uh, Wright Pad and the Wright State University. Um, I forgot to mention when I talked uh, regarding in the uh, two component uh, pairing and then also you may call two band uh, problem. And the, when you have um, uh, two band or two component pairing, then you might expect the uh, experimentally like uh, internal uh, process and uh, tunneling scheme like uh, such as the uh, helium-3 problem in the uh, A, B uh, type, uh, inside A state or B state. So if uh, seriously, you know, experimentally might be observed like a ringing frequency which is observed in the helium-3 case. And this case uh, one may uh, observed if uh, two band or two component carry is really responsible for this exciting high temperature superconductivity. So uh, some experimentalists uh, are serious and then looking for ringing frequency. Well, uh, in the two band model, there's a strong, uh, strong interband scattering mediated by phonons. So the distinction between phonon uh, uh, be between the two band e uh, electron, you know, become less clear when you have such a, a strong interband scattering. In fact, I, I, I think the existence of two uh, superconducting gaps is a clear signature of, of, uh, of, of the two band model. Okay, one last question in the back. Yes, my name is Mark Furio, MIT Lincoln Laboratory, and I have a question to Dr. Schlesinger. Um, were the measurements, your tunneling measurements that you made on the digital barium, um, were those on bulk samples or were those, those on thin film, the ones that you showed? Were those point contact? They were both point contact, their bulk samples, and thin films. I see the first data that you showed were those bulk samples? Yes. Second one was the thin films. Okay, I'd like to thank the set of speakers. Okay, we might as well begin this next session. Uh, first talk is superconductivity in the 100K range. It's given by uh, Dr. C. Politis. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm speaking today about superconductivity above 100K in ethium barium cobalt oxygen. When we know, am I? Way too low. Okay, no, it's okay, it's just not right. Okay, good morning ladies and gentlemen. I'm speaking today about superconductivity in yttrium barium copper oxygen in the range of 100K and above. My colleague, Huen Li Lo, and me, and a lot of co-workers here in uh, Karlsruhe and also in UCSD, we have tried to separate the superconducting phase in yttrium barium copper oxygen system. 
Before, let me show something here. In Lansan barium, copper, with strontium, and also with barium. By substitution of all these elements, we couldn't find any superconductivity. By substitution of all these elements, we found finally some high species. After the hanging time, it's time maybe to discuss a little more what happens in the lantern strontium systems. You see here the resistivity starting from 60 ohms to 10 milli ohms. Depends on the composition, depends on the vacancy, and also depends of the annealing conditions, you can have semiconducting properties or metallic behavior. Also, Annealing under special oxygen treatment allows to reach even in lantern strontium high DC of about 50K. In the yttrium barium system, we have the same thing. This is why I saw you before in the lantern room. Uh, number one, we have here semi-metallic behavior. Number two, metallic. And number three, uh, semiconducting behavior. Uh, in any case, you can see here that the metallic samples have higher TC and smaller delta TC. Preparing samples for purified starting materials, we could possible to synthesize materials with TC on Z over 120, 125 K. Now it's time to try to synthesize the superconducting phase because all these compositions I saw you until now, it was nominal compositions. We was be able to, to characterize all the samples as a multi-component system with minimum three different phases. And all of, of, the, of these three phases were superconducting. The first uh, try to produce single crystals was how you see here, not so many successful. We, uh, we have still some second phase here, but it's uh, how I say, just the beginning. Now I'd like to tell you something about uh, how the treatment in oxygen or in a high temperature or in vacuum on the air changes the properties and the behavior. You see here the resistivity versus temperature. All the samples starting and kneeling in air, like this black corpse, have semiconducting properties. The same samples and the same conditions, and kneeling in oxygen gives a metallic behavior. The TC is more higher as before. The same happens also here. In a higher temperature, gives more metallic behavior and a little more higher TC. Also, under annealing under high oxygen pressure, we could be able to synthesize TC a little more 120K and uh, sharp transition. Finally, I like to represent in here something you say we can smile together, but we can also discuss what happens here. We have published these results in Science Safety Physics uh, in April in Shur. The drop of the resistivity began here in 240K and going down. You see here three different samples. I like to mention here the special these samples with a nominal composition, yttrium 1.2, barium 0.8, copper, oxygen 4, is even not single phase, we have still three different phase here. The only thing is, the depends of the path of the samples, but also of the conditions, uh, we must be able to obtain a zero resistivity below any resolu instrumental resolution in about 20 to 80 K. Uh, I like to be a little more skeptic and say could be that here is also some more transitions. We are not exactly sure what happens. Thank you for your attention.
Uh, the next talk is uh, high TC superconductivity in ternary and quaternary copper oxide based systems by Professor Jack Crow. Make this quick since it's uh, been seen many times. What we'd like to do is talk about some magnetic measured uh, critical fields and JCs and very comparable to much of the data that has been presented today. It has been in the multi-phase uh, compounds, but really what one is looking is, as they have indicated, um, many people looking at the structural, we're looking at that phase. The uh, superconducting phase transition resistivity is quite sharp, up at about uh, uh, starting at about 100 degrees and, and going to zero at 92 degrees. And I'm talking about magnetization measurements on uh, this sample here. Here's the hysteresis at 4.2. 20% of the sample is roughly superconducting. It has an HC1 somewhere around 3 uh, kilogauss and uh, considerable hysteresis clear out to uh, 9 tesla. If you look at the warming the uh, thing in field, comes down, magnetization goes away. If you blow this region up, there's a paramagnetic component to it, which I think has also been mentioned. It is shown much stronger here in this uh, uh, higher field. Uh, this we take as the critical temperature in field. Uh, it's uh, sharp, fairly distinct. It certainly sets an upper limit on the critical field. And if you then plot that, uh, it gives you this uh, linear dependence near TC and an HC2 dT of about 2.7 tesla per, de per degree. Uh, if you look at that, uh, the, uh, that slope, it really extrapolates out in numbers that have been mentioned before here, up of the order of certainly above a, a mega gauss. Uh, if you look back at the critical currents, which are done lower than Fenimore's have, uh, have done, we get critical currents here at these field values of about 1,600 amps per square centimeter at uh, uh, 2 tesla and about 1.2 uh, times 10 to the 3 amps per square centimeter at 4 tesla. We've also done some hydrostatic pressure up to a little over 20 kilobars so far and going up higher, and there's just a very slight pressure dependence, not nearly as large as was seen in the uh, lanthanum strontium. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Next talk is uh, given by uh, Dr. Marl Cohen, spin melting and superconductivity. I'm going to talk about is a collaboration between David Douglas and myself. Collaboration started on uh, 20 years ago with a 20-year hiatus, and recent events have started us think, uh, thinking about high temperature superconductivity again, as with so many other people. Uh, actually, uh, after hearing all those real measurements on real materials, it might be a pleasant break to step off the real axis and talk about imaginary things. Uh, I want to explore ideas that uh, Phil Anderson and Kivelson, uh, Roxar, and Sefna have talked about. As Anderson has already told you, uh, he's interested in a uh, spin liquid uh, associated with a half-filled uh, uh, band. And the idea is that pairs are formed, the resonating valence bond picture. With doping, the pairs are free to move for the temperature less than the crit critical temperature of the pairs condense, uh, driven by the, an attractive interaction, the exchange interaction, and you get uh, superconductivity with a characteristic charge of 2E. On the other hand, Kibbelson, Roxar, and Sethner uh, do what is uh, essentially the same thing. They have a dynamic spin piles transition in a half-filled band, 
but the phonons are inessential and they're really talking about the same thing. So one has pairs which move around, then doping leads to charge boson defects which have a single uh, charge, 1E, and T below TC, there's a Bose-Einstein condensation, uh, and one has superconductivity char characterized by a charge of 1E. And so is there a contradiction in these two pictures? In order to answer that question, I want to summarize some results we have gotten in the theory of the, ma uh, the magnetic and electric phase diagram of this uh, simple one-half filled quasi-two-dimensional square band. Uh, we say that there is a metal. Uh, uh, at the Mott-Hubbard transition, it goes into a spin liquid state. Then there is a line of spin melting, and it goes into the spin crystal state. I should mention that my axes are the hopping integral divided by the uh, Coulomb interaction, the Hubbard interaction, and the, uh, the excuse me, the dis uh, some measure of the disorder is, uh, is, is on the vertical axis. Now, the charge defects are not points, they tend to spread out in density. And at low doping, uh, one has isolated defects. But as the doping increases, they, these are going to overlap, become unstable with increased doping at some characteristic uh, uh, transition. And thus, you have a somewhat richer superconductivity phase diagram from this model than you might otherwise have first supposed. If one plots TC, uh, against the doping, one gets initially the Bose-Einstein condensation with some effective interaction and overlap. Then there's some kind of transition, which I don't understand. And uh, uh, as the uh, defects dissolve, the pairs become free, and one can get pair condensation in the kind of superconductivity that Anderson and his collaborators talk, uh, talked about initially, like so. So here, as a function of x, in this picture, one would see a Bose-Einstein condensation with 1E, followed by a pair condensation uh, with 2E, if one looked at zero temperature. And on the other hand, in the spin crystal, one can put Bose defects, uh, that is, in an AL state, on either sublattice. The relevant relative concentration would, of course, be affected by the field. And they actually move these defects. There's an effective charge transfer integral, which is essentially the same size as the exchange. And as a consequence, they can condense. But they would also disappear at some other critical concentration. One would that get free pairs uh, with the uh, uh, spin up component on one sublattice, the spin down component on the other sublattice. And this leads to a condensation in which the TC is enhanced in a very important way by the fact that you have a spatial modulation of the spin up and spin down wave functions, and the two members of the pair do not sit in the same place in space. There's a reduced overlap. And uh, Dave uh, Douglas and I uh, uh, had an idea which contained this element, which we public, uh, published in 1967. Uh, it, however, the, uh, the theory as presented contained a fatal flaw, and as far as we know, there are no citations, so we're going to try to resurrect that idea. The main point here is that the phase diagram that I showed you for the spin liquid state uh, uh, is essentially the same as the phase diagram for the, uh, for the Nayel state, and one comes to similar conclusions about high temperature superconductivity. Thank you very much.